Let's talk about Bell's Palsy in adults. So Bell's Palsy is an idiopathic facial nerve palsy and it comprises about 50% of facial nerve palsies. It's suspected to be caused by a viral etiology, most commonly herpes simplex, uh, but otherwise the next most common cause is thought to be herpes zoster. There can be increased risk, about three times risk, of Bell's palsy during pregnancy and the first week postpartum. So how does it present? Usually it's acute onset over a few hours and it can progress for up to three weeks. The most common feature is unilateral facial droop and this is because the facial nerve innervates the facial muscles through the motor fibers. There can sometimes be other features such as loss of taste over the anterior two-thirds of the tongue because the facial nerve also has the taste afferents. There can be decreased tearing, and this is because of the parasympathetics to the lacrimal glands. And there can also be hyperacusis due to stapedius paralysis. And this is not commonly tested for, but sometimes there can be salivation changes because the facial nerve also has parasympathetics to the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. So in terms of diagnosis, the most important thing is to rule out other causes of facial nerve palsy because different diagnoses can lead to different treatments. So you'll want to, during the physical exam, look for forehead sparing, and this can hint towards a central cause, which can be detected by CT or MRI. And depending on where you think the cause of the facial nerve lesion is, you'll want to include the brain, temporal bone, and or the parotid gland. You'll want to look in the external ear if you see vesicles or scabbing. This can indicate herpes zoster. And if you see, feel any masses in the parotid gland, you'll want to do a biopsy. Uh, Lyme serology can also be useful in patients that are living in Lyme endemic areas. So in terms of treatment, once you've diagnosed the patient as idiopathic facial nerve palsy, you'll want to uh, start steroids within three days of symptom onset. This is usually done with a prednisone 60 milligrams daily for one week, and it can improve recovery from about 70% to 80 or 85%. There may be some small role to play for acyclovir and valacyclovir, but currently the mainstay of treatment is monotherapy with prednisone. You'll also want to focus on eye care because the eye will dry out if you don't, and you'll want to give the patient artificial tears uh, both during awake and sleep time, and when they're sleeping you'll want to tape the eye shut. In terms of prognosis, there is recovery by four to six months, and if there is not recovery by that time, you'll want to consider an alternate diagnosis. And you might have to re-image them or biopsy. So otherwise, uh, you can do motor nerve conduction studies at day 10, and the compound muscle action potential or CMAP will estimate the degree of axonal loss. So, for example, if the CMAP is only 10% of normal, then there is estimated to be around 90% axonal loss. You can also do needle EMG at 20 to 30 days, and that can confirm the denervation and axonal loss. And furthermore, you can also repeat the EMG at three months to assess for re innervation and uh, chance for recovery. In about 10% of patients, Bell's palsy can reoccur. There's one last complication that I wanted to talk about called synkinesia, and it occurs in 15% of patients with Bell palsy, and it's due to misdirected nerve regrowth during the recovery phase. So a few months down the road, they may have some involuntary movements that happen during voluntary movements 
For example, when they're smiling, they might blink involuntarily, or when they're blinking, they might smile involuntarily. There's also a phenomenon called crocodile tears, where the nerve fibers for salivation are misdirected uh, towards the lacrimal glands, and you might be crying whenever you have a stimulus to salivate. Uh, especially bothersome symptoms can be treated with botulinum toxin.